In this week's drive, we track the progress of a champion, raise a dust storm in the desert, watch the new guy challenge the champ, and see what a snowmobile can do without snow. All this and more in this week's Drive. We start this week with a detailed look at one of the many new models launched at the recent Geneva Motor Show, the Cabrio version of the new Mini, which is one of the two famous British brands controlled by BMW. The other, of course, is at the other end of the motoring rainbow, Rolls-Royce. The new Mini, which is very much bigger than its famous predecessor, has been a huge hit round the world, and a drop-top version is likely to find favour with the fun and sunset. Since launching Mini in late summer 2001, we sold approximately 345,000 Minis up to the end of last year. This includes sales of more than 176,000 units last year alone, which means an increase of 22.4% over the previous year. Premium, therefore, is not a question of size, but rather a question of the right concept. Mini enjoys a great image and outstanding popularity the world over simply because it is different from other small cars and is acknowledged as being unique by all age and population groups. Mini is something special. There is no alternative to Mini. Mini appeals to young and affluent customers of both sexes. We also see this from the car's superior model mix. But why a convertible? Firstly, because the emotional driving concept of such a car is a perfect fit for the extroverted Mini brand. Secondly, because the Mini convertible enables us to win over new customers from the rapidly growing segment of compact convertibles, which has tripled in volume worldwide in the last four years alone. The Mini convertible is clearly distinguishable at first sight as a genuine Mini, and it offers space for four passengers. Pressing a button, you first open the infinitely adjustable sliding roof integrated in the soft top, and then the complete roof. The entire process of opening the roof fully automatically takes a mere 15 seconds. A further point is that you can open the sliding roof part of the soft top while driving at a speed of up to 120 kilometres an hour. Launching the two mini convertibles in Europe in early July, we expect further momentum in our worldwide sales and we could well imagine a further increase of Mini's global sales volume by the end of the year. Creating a convertible is a feat of engineering in its own right, as the integrity of the body is very important to the feel of a car which gets a large slice of its appeal from its cart-like drivability. The limited luggage space available in the Mini could have been cut even more by the mechanism required to lower and store the soft top roof. But in creating the Z mechanism that operates the roof, the designers and engineers have found an elegant solution without requiring the release of any catches or clamps. While the roof folds to the rear, the roof pillars automatically retract into the car and the two rear side windows move down completely. The roof is finally folded into three layers on top of one another in a compact, space-saving arrangement behind the rear seats. With the Z mechanisms keeping the dimension of the folded roof to a minimum, the boot capacity is only slightly reduced with the roof down. Once the Cabrio goes on sale, it's expected to account for one in five of all Minis sold. Just like the rest of the family, the Cabrio has four seats, go-kart style handling, and an optional equipment list longer than any other car in its class. Four airbags and parking distance control are fitted as standard. The new cars use the same engines as their hatchback counterparts. Mini 1 gets a 1.6-litre engine producing 68 kilowatts and a top speed of 175 kilometres an hour. 0 to 100 is reached in 11.8 seconds. The Cooper version has an output of 87 kilowatts and a top speed of 195 kilometres an hour. And 0 to 100 is reached in 9.8 seconds. 
the Mini 1 and Cooper Cabrios will be in European dealers' showrooms in the summer of this year. Both models will be built at Oxford in the UK alongside the four models already in production, Mini 1 and Mini Diesel, Cooper and Cooper S. The Cabrio family will be completed this year with the introduction of a Cooper S version. Americans are installing DVD players to keep their kids entertained during increasingly stressful, traffic jam-ridden journeys. One of the great benefits of having the DVD player is that with less fighting and less distractions, I'm more able to focus on the road and I don't have to be worried about what's happening behind me. Americans are hooked on road movies. In fact, DVD players have become so popular they're available in 15% of all new cars and in every single minivan on the market, such as this Nissan, which has two LCD screens as well as three sunroofs. DVD systems in vehicles is huge these days. You can't drive down the freeway at night without seeing the illumination of somebody else's screen. And that's something that you wouldn't have seen hardly even a year ago. As road test coordinator for the well-respected Edmunds.com automotive website, Kelly is exposed to most new vehicles and trends in buyer's behavior right across America. Okay. Everyone in. According to a new nationwide survey, one in 10 Americans already have some type of in-vehicle video system. And more than one in three of those surveyed said a DVD video system is high on their wish lists for a new car. The survey showed that in-car movies do more than just entertain. Over half said the entertainment helped reduce child behavior problems and questions like, are we there yet? I notice that I'm more focused on the road and safety because my children are less likely to be fighting in the back and they're less distracted. So they're happier, we're safer, and it's a much more happy driving experience. But if there were an award for the favorite in-car movie, it would go to Finding Nemo, number one with both kids and their parents. It used to be that my favorite accessory was a great stereo system. Now, driving with the kids in the car, my favorite accessory is definitely the DVD player. DVD systems in vehicles is really a huge phenomenon. Uh, more and more vehicles have them on their standard equipment list, and they allow passengers in the back to be entertained while the driver is allowed to focus his full attention to the road. And besides, who doesn't love a movie? When American parents reflected on their own childhood road trips, most wished their parents had had DVDs when they were growing up. Half said they would have fought less with their siblings during car trips if they had DVD players in their vehicles. When asked about movie preferences, nearly half of the 1,000 adults surveyed preferred comedies. Half said their children preferred cartoons, but 44% would rather that their kids watched educational movies. For both kids and adults, Finding Nemo was tops. No other single movie featured in both lists. BMW's latest safety innovation is called Active Steering. It's the latest approach to road safety and provides features similar to steer-by-wire systems. However, it still delivers the authentic steering feedback for which all BMW cars are famous. Active steering, not to be confused with ordinary power-assisted steering, combines a conventional rack and pinion steering gear with a planetary gear and an electric motor. It can modify the driver's steering input, although there is still a mechanical link between the steering wheel and the front axle. But if there's a system failure, the electric motor is locked out, keeping the mechanical link between the steering wheel and the front axle fully operational. Thereafter, the active steering equipped car can be driven as a conventional vehicle. A major feature of the active steering system is the variable steering ratio, not the same as variable assistance in which the electric motor modifies the driver's required steering wheel input at low speeds, creating a more direct steering ratio that requires less steering effort and improves handling. When parking, active steering requires less than two turns of the steering wheel from lock to lock, and the variable assistance takes the effort out of it. The supporting effect of the electric motor will be reduced with speed. Consequently, the steering ratio becomes less direct. However, active steering provides a much more direct steering ratio than conventional steering systems up to a speed of about 120 kilometers an hour. 
direct steering ratio improves handling and enhances the driving experience in a large speed range. At high speed, the system works the other way, giving a more indirect steering ratio, reducing reaction to subtle inputs to ensure straight line stability. Generally, sudden, severe lane changes will cause a major yaw reaction and can induce oversteer, no matter what car is involved. In these situations, active steering will easily perform a swift counter-steer reaction and stabilize the car much faster than any driver possibly could. However, active steering cannot extend the limits of physics, and another safety system, Dynamic Stability Control, or DSC, is still required to ensure the vehicle's stability in all driving situations. Thus, active steering works in collaboration with DSC, but it can't replace it. Improvement in feedback is evident to virtually every driver. However, active steering is still a mechanical link between the steering wheel and the front axle. So, unlike drive-by-wire, it retains the authentic steering feedback for which every BMW is renowned. We all know that hydrogen is the fuel of the future. It has little impact on the environment, and its only emission is water. Well, it's a very old concept, because hydrogen stores a lot of energy. And for example, if you're operating a spacecraft, then hydrogen is a natural fuel for, for spacecraft, and it's been used for many, many decades. In a home, it's more difficult to, to persuade people to use hydrogen because we've got plentiful supplies of natural gas right now, or even oil, and previously coal. So these fuels have dominated, and hydrogen has not been very popular. But in the future, because it has these advantages of cleanliness and of efficiency, it will gradually take over and, and substitute for natural gas and for these other fuels like oil. At Birmingham University, the research is concentrating around the storage of the gas, but they are convinced it's a very clean energy system. There are, in my mind, three main drivers for wanting hydrogen as the fuel of the future. Uh, one is security of supply. So that, I mean, for instance, if we are dependent on natural gas from uh, uh, remote areas and areas of uh, political uh, instability, then that can be a major problem. There is the fact that fossil fuel, and particularly oil, will be largely exhausted in 50 years' time, and that's not very long. And thirdly, there's the problem of global warming. Nine major European cities, including London, are currently taking part in trials for hydrogen-powered buses. It's a continuing project that brings together more than 40 international organizations concerned not only with public transport, but also cleaner, more efficient forms of power. However, hydrogen is a dangerous substance and it requires special equipment, so don't expect hydrogen stations in your neighborhood soon. This NASCAR race was supposed to be the first test of a new combination of a shorter rear spoiler and softer tires, intended to make racing more exciting and allowing more passing. But the race didn't look much different than the previous six on the one-and-a-half-mile Las Vegas Oval, with lots of single-file racing. There were 18 lead changes among 10 drivers, but many came during pit stops. Reigning champ Matt Kenseth, who started 25th, led for 123 laps, including the final 38 in the DeVault car. There was none to challenge Kenseth after he moved past Kevin Harvick on lap 230 to regain the lead for the fourth and final time in the 267-lap event. Two weeks earlier, Kenseth fought off a challenge from rookie Casey Kane, winning by inches. 23-year-old Kane, in only his third cup start, finished second again, inheriting the runner-up spot five laps from the end when Harvick ran out of fuel and coasted to the pits, finishing 21st. He weaved furiously, trying to find those last few drops, but in vain. Driving a Ford, Kenseth motored to victory by 3.4 seconds over Kane, who started the race on pole position. Tony Stewart was third in a Pontiac. Mark Martin, fifth. Elliot the victory was the eighth of Kenseth's career and vaulted him into the series point lead, one race sooner than he took the top spot for good on the way to the 2003 title. He leads Stewart by 88 points going into the next race at Atlanta Motor Speedway. 
The 2004 Formula One Powerboat World Championship got underway in Mumbai, the first time the Powerboat Tour has stopped off on the Indian subcontinent. Water conditions were rough and the intense heat made racing conditions difficult. Starting in pole position, eight times world champion Guido Capolini of Italy got off to a good start, closely followed by American Scott Gilman and Finn Sami Celio. But his lead was short-lived as Gilman took over, followed by Italian Francesco Contando, forcing Capolini into third. Several drivers were forced to retire, the most spectacular reason, a fire on the boat of another Finn, Perti Lepola. Later, a Conrod let go in Gilman's engine, destroying it and forcing him out the race. That ensured a significant lead for Cantando and a clear run to the chequered flag. With a boat perfectly designed for the challenging course, Cantando duly secured the win, his first since last summer's German Grand Prix at Stralsund. Eight times world champion Capolini was second, while Leith Farouin of Saudi Arabia, who started in eighth position, claimed third place. The 29-year-old from Milan cruised to his 10th career win and now leads the table for the 2004 driver's title. As the series moves to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia for the first time in its history, and that dates back to 1981. Italian Capolini claimed the rough water conditions didn't suit his shorter DAC machine on the 1.5-kilometer course. Capolini is still looking for his first victory in six outings. He hasn't won since last July's Grand Prix of the Mediterranean in Cagliari in Sardinia. The Middle East Rally Championship moved to Bahrain just a few weeks ahead of the region's first Formula One Grand Prix. Sheikh Khalid al Qasimi of the United Arab Emirates and his British co-driver Michael Orr started the event as clear favourites. Driving a Subaru Impreza, al Qasimi won the 582-kilometre, two-day, 16-stage event to take the overall lead after two rounds in the eight-event Middle East Rally Championship. With Nasser Sali al of Qatar, the winner of January's opening round in Dubai, taking part in the World Championship Rally in Mexico, al Qasimi came to Bahrain looking to improve on his second-place finish in Dubai. After the eight-stage first day, however, he trailed by 51 seconds to the UAE's Rashid al ketbi in a Mitsubishi Lancer. By the end of the 11th stage on day two, al Qasimi had fought back to take the lead by just one second from al ketbi who was then forced to retire on the next stage with a seized engine. This left al Qasimi in a clear lead, going on to win by two minutes and 28 seconds from Andreas Tsoloftis of Cyprus in a Mitsubishi Lancer. The Cypriot fought back from a three-minute penalty for a GPS infringement to claim second. Another Lancer driver, Michel Sali, also from the UAE, was third, seven seconds further behind. Amjad Farah of Jordan in yet another Lancer, car number 10, was fourth, three minutes, 30 seconds behind. But both teams were eventually disqualified from the results, promoting Essa al Dasari into third place. Al Qasimi's win gives him a total of 18 points in the championship standings, eight clear of Al Atiyah, with Soloftus on eight points. The third round of the eight event FIA Middle East Rally Series takes place in Oman at the end of April. The Phillip Island track near Melbourne in Australia hosted three days of testing for the Yamaha Works teams ahead of the forthcoming 2004 MotoGP season. But the island's notoriously fickle weather turned cold, wet and blowy. Early sessions were interrupted by heavy winds and rain, but the team's new boy, MotoGP world champion Valentino Rossi, managed to get some experience on his new bike. Initially disappointed with the engine's performance in early tests, the 25-year-old Italian convinced team bosses to create more horsepower. Once the weather had improved on day one, Rossi had an opportunity to assess the changes for himself and completed 14 laps in the afternoon. A fastest lap of 1 minute 32.1 seconds gave Rossi an achievable mark to better when testing continued on the second and third days. Rossi won the 500cc championship in 2001 and lifted the inaugural MotoGP title in 2002, defending it in 2003, taking all three titles with Honda. Shifting to the uncompetitive Yamaha this season should provide more of a challenge for Rossi, but he is determined to have his new bike as good as he can make it. Yes, today we, we don't make very much uh, because uh, rain, 
we make uh, some laps on, on under the rain with this bike, but only some laps because uh, after the conditions are uh, middle, <laughs> it's possible work only one hour and a half, and uh, for sure the, the condition of the track is not is not very good. We don't have very much uh, grip, but anyway, we continue our work. We continue to to work uh, on the on the engine. We try to some some different setting, and uh, we hope tomorrow and the next day have, have a good weather for uh, for uh, continue to work on the setting and uh, to improve the bike. As well as a new team, Rossi also has a new teammate. Carlos Checa may be entering his sixth season with the factory Yamaha team, but he was more than two seconds slower than Rossi. The Spaniard clocked a fastest time of one minute thirty four point three seconds and has plenty of room for improvement. Marco Malandri said it was good to get a few laps around the circuit in the wet to better understand the bike more. But when it's neither wet nor dry, it's impossible to achieve anything. When the track was finally dry, it was dirty and the wind made it tricky. They did manage to test a few things, however, especially throttle linkages and the drive out of turns. There's still more to be done, but the weather needed to improve. If it did, they would focus on tyre testing and an endurance run. During the session, Norik Abe's best time was three seconds off Rossi's pace. The Japanese rider completed 35 laps to Rossi's 14. Checker finished 22, while Melandri managed 49. The old Pabst Brewery, built in 1844, provided the backdrop for the third annual Fuel and Fury competition. The riders took to the course in front of the old brewery to show how creative snowmobiles can be, especially when there's no snow around. Due to recent warm weather and a lack of snow in Milwaukee, the course builders were forced to improvise. Lacking help from Mother Nature, they decided that the show would go on, so they trucked in 1,100 cubic yards of dirt and 800 cubic yards of wood chips to build the course. Dotting the snowless course were an old school bus, a 55-foot wide gap jump, three launch ramps and a 40-foot long rainbow rail. Let's see what he's got. The jumps and other obstacles illustrated freestyle snowmobiling's evolution from motocross and BMX, where riders perform complex aerials and use a variety of ramps and rails throughout their runs. The riders were judged on their style, difficulty and overall aptitude for the course. At about 400 pounds, freestyle snowmobiles are lighter than standard snowmobiles. They use custom hand grips for technical grabs and releases and have specially modified suspensions to absorb the punishing landings. The riders perform tricks such as heel clickers, Indian airs and supermans before an appreciative audience. Local rider Justin Hoyer showcased a variety of such moves including a heart attack, stripper, corpse, and a Superman seat grab with enough flair to win over Chris Burant and Canada's Lee Stewart. After his performance, he said the unusual course provided opportunities for new and innovative moves. I think it was a level playing field for everybody, which was cool because there's so many elements that don't belong with snowmobiling, like no snow first off, and then you know, you have things like a rail and all that kind of stuff. So a lot of things were new to everybody, which was cool. Snowmobile competitions without snow. The beginnings of a whole new world, perhaps. So whether you're letting the sunshine in, avoiding the dust, or just trying to win a world title. So you stay on track and up to speed. Make sure you catch next week's Drive.